housing insecurity, according to the census. Test one, two. Hey, Paul, this is Christian. Hi, Christian. Hey there. Yeah, you got a nice, strong sound. Why don't you play a little piano, too, so we get a sense of that volume. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. Thanks. There's all the people. Mute myself. Everybody, I, I have a question. If, can anybody hear me? Sure. Yes. We need, yes. Have, we need to have a copy of the music in front of us. Good. That would be useful. I can't remember our password. Uh, you don't. Uh, so this is Christian. Uh, you don't need it. The password. Okay. Bc uh, bcco dot org slash summer singing okay i think let me double check that otherwise um the, the uh hold on, let me just get a let's double check that's from memory hold on i, I managed to do it last week but i forgot how to do that all right it's BC. i'm gonna mute it mute everybody and then i'll mute myself so you can hear me hold on yeah i have the same problem. so uh, what you want is bcco.org slash summer hyphen singing. And then I'll say furthermore that when we are rehearsing against the recordings, tonight's recordings, you'll actually see the score, the staff on the screen, but it may still be helpful for you to have another window or a printout. And I'll put that URL in the chat as well for people who need to find. Yeah, somebody did. Thank you, Daniel. You're welcome.
Hello, everybody. It is 7 o'clock, or 7.01, on uh, this Monday evening. And, of course, we are here for the summer sing of the Tippet, A Child of Our Time. And I think you can all agree that last week, our session with Brandy Sutton was just absolutely incredible. Uh, one thing that she kept on saying over and over again is that, you know, her goal is to try to be as communicative, as emotionally connected to the music as possible. And as we wait for people to come in, we give a little bit of time to allow people to uh, join in before we start with our warm-ups. I want to talk a little bit about that because, you know, there is this whole thing about period practice, for instance, when you talk about what music of Beethoven actually sounded like. And there's a whole movement to how we approach the instruments, what type of instruments we actually use. You know, for instance, the instruments didn't have as much range back then. And so instruments like the uh, string basses. The music that Beethoven wrote actually is altered quite a bit to adjust for the technical limitations of the bass. And so a question that comes up all the time is that it currently basses actually have the ability to play some of those notes that Beethoven intended. We know he intended because it's very awkwardly written and the cellos are doing something else and they've been going in unison for such a long time. But the, there's one thought, of course, is that Beethoven's intentions were very clear, that he wanted to have the string basses, but they didn't have the capacity at that time. Uh, or the same thing for the horn, I think I've mentioned about Brahms and the natural horn. But we also have the same train of thought that said, you know, this is a music that Beethoven wrote, and that's the music that he would have heard. And, you know, I think Brandy's point is well taken, which is that regardless about what side you decide or how you would approach things musically, the important thing is that the performance needs to be engaging and, and powerful and connect to what the essence of that work is. And so for opera, like she mentioned, it's actually quite easy because what her job is to do is to connect to the character and the feelings of the character of the music. And then the issues of stylistic things, um, um, of, of, of some of the minor details like that uh, fall to the side. They're really important, of course, but they are um, something that is less important. And so, you know, oftentimes you might see a period performance orchestra that is everything is correct. You know, the right instruments, the right type of bows. You know, we have very different type of bows for Bach than we do nowadays because they actually didn't have that edge point. Um, and it was much more curved like a bow. And as a result, they didn't actually have even pressure all the way down the bow line. And so the style of playing is actually very different. But you can go to a performance that's all correct but doesn't have emotional content. It actually is kind of boring. You know, the music is present there and it is not um, very evocative. It's not very compelling. And so I think our goal, as always, is to remember what the underlying meaning for some of these, like we talked about, like Julia talked about last week. When we sing Steal Away, that was actually code. It was not only the beauty of these chords, but that there is hidden meaning underneath that. And that actually dictates a lot of how these things can be approached from an emotional standpoint and, and as a result, as a performance standpoint. And so those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Of course, we want to talk about style. All the things about American singing come that we try to avoid in classical and oratorio performances, symphonic choral, actually are things that we give into for singing spirituals and gospels. We drop consonants. We actually sing a lot more schwas. So you're gonna be, we're actually going to be working on that quite a bit today. So again, try to not only connect with the underlying meaning of these spirituals and sing through, but also in addition to that, of course, try to sing them in a way that's going to be um, a little bit more of the style. Um, now, I think I've been asked, we are planning, hopefully, if we can get them, because videographers 
and sound engineers are actually in high demand right now, so it's really hard to get them to respond. But our intention is actually to have um, a stitch together performance of those who want to participate um, to create a little visual and audio memento of our uh, time during the summer. And that is going to be very similar to some of the other stitch together performances you might see for orchestra. Uh, the Met Opera, like I mentioned, I think some weeks ago, uh, did their gala virtually like that. Um, or Oakland Symphony has done that. Um, I don't think Berkeley Symphony has, but some other orchestras, um, I'm sure Santa Cruz has, uh, to try to get a stitch together performance. And what it is is that we would record our individual part and send it in to a recording engineer who would kind of push it all together. And even though it might feel a little bit scary singing into, you know, a recording that goes out and is your, your voice, but again, it's the same sort of nervousness that we tend to overcome during performances. And as I say to BCCO members or regular members, often, if we all take that small, uncomfortable step forward to sing and connect to the music, what ends up happening is that the ex there's an exponential um, uh, increase in the engagement of the singing. Not only our individual voices, but everybody collectively together. And again, even with the professional instrumentalists that do this for a living, the alignment and the precision of everything is something that's always adjusted. Individual voice parts, they can actually move your notes if you're slightly out of time or move the intonation up, up and down a little bit. So it doesn't need to be a perfect performance. What is important is that it's a performance of you. Right, that you participate in are us, even though we're virtually all together. But the important thing is that this is something that we can all connect to. And again, the collective performance of everybody put together is going to be something that you're not going to be like, oh my god, I can hear myself and I don't think I sound very good. That's not going to happen at all. You know, again, it's going to be a performance where we all feel like it's an ensemble. The sound engineers are magnificent in that way. I've seen them work, you know, technology is so amazing. They can like move pizzicati and string instruments and you know like a single trumpet player comes in the wrong place they just kind of move it out of the way so it's again the whole point is it's not something to stress us out it's something that is going to be fun and when we get our video you know next year when we're out of this it's going to be a memento of these times together and i hope to look back to say this and say oh yeah you know, not only our performance together, but Brandy Sutton, I remember her, I can remember almost every single note that she sang, so amazing. And these moments that even though this is a time that there is a lot of things stressful going on, that there's still moments that still move us, that still connect us, and that we remember with fondness. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julia, who is going to our assistant conductor. And I should note, I think I've maybe mentioned it only to the board, but Julia has decided, because of various reasons, most likely that she can't actually be in person on campus for grad school, that she's going to be deferring grad school for another year. And so officially, we'd like to welcome Julia back for the entirety of next season as our assistant conductor again. So Julia, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ming. And thank you. I can see everyone clapping. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was a weird couple of weeks while I made that decision, but it is made sweeter by the fact that I can spend more time with you. Uh, BCCO has been my musical family, and I'm, I'm just really happy to spend more time with you all. So, um, okay, so let's start with a nice good warm up. Good evening. Happy Monday. Let's start standing. Um, I'm going to adjust my screen. Okay. Um, and let's just start with a nice good stretch. So let's reach one arm up to the sky and reach it and stretch, stretch, stretch. So you just stretch it up to the ceiling and as much as possible, stretch your side and just feel your arm just lifting up. You're trying to get a nice good stretch in. And then bring that arm down and reach your other arm up. And same thing, but stretch, stretch, stretch. Try to be as long as possible. So you're also stretching your torso, you're stretching your, your legs and your thighs as you're doing this. You're just trying to stretch everything out. Great, and now let's bring our arm down and take your head and very gently lean it to one side. Take your hand and kind of just apply just a tiny bit of extra weight to it. Um, not You're not trying to yank your head down, but just kind of give it a little bit extra um, for some stretch and then take your opposite shoulder and just kind of actively pull it down and back. 
so that you get a nice good neck stretch in there just to relax those neck muscles and take a nice couple of deep breaths and relax and check in with your body how's your body doing today does it feel tight or tense all right and let's move our head over to the other side same thing taking one hand and very gently applying just a tiny bit of extra pressure your opposite shoulder pulling down and back so that you get a nice good stretch if you need to you can also modify so if you know that the back of your neck is a little bit um, more tense you can maybe stretch it your neck down a little bit or if you know that you need a good stretch maybe right here you can kind of lean back a little bit so modify as your neck needs as your body needs and then let's come back up to center and roll your shoulders back and clasp your hands together release your jaw and let it go slack and go <laughs> make as much noise as possible <laughs> that would be a great moment to unmute us all <laughs> to hear all of our noises um i'm sorry that we can't hear us all but i think that was really great to see us all doing that on gallery view Hopefully that was relaxing your jaw. I was, I've was i been noticing that wearing masks all the time these days, um, anytime you go outside, it, I feel just a lot more tense in um, my face and my jaw, and that kind of goes against what we need to sing. So it's good to just kind of relax everything. Um, so now let's go ahead and find a good standing position. So make sure that your feet are hip width apart underneath your hips and bounce your knees a little bit to remind yourself not to lock them and then come up still with a little bit of buoyancy in them make sure that your hips are kind of uh over your feet and that you are stretching up your torso you have a nice good posture your sternum is up and out and you're ready to take some nice deep breaths so go ahead on your own pace take a nice deep breath go ahead and close your eyes this is kind of checking in with your body Take a nice deep breath in and notice which muscles that you're engaging, which muscles you're not engaging. Do you, are you, do you feel like you're clenching your jaw? Do you need to clench your jaw to breathe? Just kind of relax things that you know you don't need and engage what you do. So take another nice deep breath in, thinking about that and exhale. And now when Ellen joined us um, a few weeks ago, she mentioned this idea of your breath being kind of a canister. So I know we talk a lot about down and out when you breathe in, but she talked about this kind of ideal that your entire torso is this barrel or this canister that you breathe into. So instead of thinking down and out, think out this way as well. And even out this way, just everything, just everything just fills up like a giant canister. So take a nice deep breath in for four beats and then exhale for four beats and we'll kind of refresh that and go through that a few times. Ready? And breathe in into your canister and out, two, three, four, and in. Maybe a fuller breath if you can. And out, and in, and out. Last one, and in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four. Great, and now we are going to breathe in on one beat and then hiss out on an SH, so shh for eight beats. So the idea is to find that full capacity of your lungs and your canister that you need to breathe in, find that full capacity in one beat without gasping, so letting it drop in, and then controlling and using that air over eight full beats. So I'll give you three beats just to kind of prep, but don't breathe in until that fourth beat for that breath. So one, two, three, breathe. And SH, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and off. Great, we'll try that one more time. Thinking about what, what you did, what you can do better. See if you can, if you feel too much pressure up here to make the SH, make sure that it's nice and uh, supported so that you're using your breathing muscles down here when you breathe in and then also breathe out, that you're controlling things from here and not just your mouth. So it's not shh, but shh. So it's nice and strong and controlled. So let's try that again. Ready and breathe in. Off. Great. And now let's do some singing. So stay standing and correct your posture. Make sure your knees have some bounce and we will do some low trills. So we'll start with. Last one. 
of keeping that jaw nice and relaxed as we sing. Uh, we'll just sing oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So keep your jaw nice and relaxed. Uh, we will say ah, ya, yeah, ya, yeah, but not using your jaw, only using your tongue. So you don't have to engage your jaw at all. Ah, ya, 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 ya. If you want, you can even put a hand on your cheeks just to remind yourself not to engage your jaw. Here we go. Ready? And sing. Ah, ya, 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 ya. second we're gonna keep going with that um, but even when you take a breath in again uh, you don't have to close your mouth for that so if you go you can still keep that your jaw open nice and loose and relaxed so you don't have to close your mouth in the middle so let's start here one more time ready and sing So we'll sing and you should feel that forward ping or that fuzziness or that you should just feel very itchy as Ming said last week kind of in your nose um, and we're looking for that 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 will give you sound and um, will help project your sound so see if you can find that buzz ready and sing to lift your soft palate. So even though we're singing an E vowel, Z know that you're about to drop to the A. Ah, keep that soft palate space when you sing the E vowel still. Z ah, ah, ah. So you don't have to make as many modifications when you get to the A. Ah. Here we go. Ready and sing. Z ah, ah, ah. Z ah, ah, ah. Z too spread. So, fika. Instead, kind of bring the corners of your lips in. Fika. And then last thing, that K sound, that K can help you lift your soft palate. If you think of the bounce after the K. Fika. That can help you 
kind of make the space that you need once we get up a little bit higher. So here we go with all of those three things in mind. Ready? And Fico. I seem to have uh, turned off my video instead of the sound. And so you heard me all telling Google to turn off the dining room lights. <laughs> if you don't use Google, it's like the Siri or uh, Alexa or whatnot. So we can control our lights with, uh, with our voice. But in any case, what we're going to do now is that um, we want to actually play through or listen to a recording with your parts to two performances. Um, one of Steal Away and one of Deep River before we go off into sectionals. And then I'm going to actually talk again before we go off into sectionals just a little bit about some of the stylistic things that we might hear and how we approach this music. Because if, and I should say when, BCCO does the tip in A Child of Our Time, you actually change styles significantly between singing the more, um, the spirituals versus the rest of the piece. And so understanding how we approach these works is going to be um, a key. But since we are just singing the spirituals, these two spirituals, and then one for recording, um, we can just focus on that style. But in any case, I'm going to hand it over to Christian, who is going to play one and then the other, uh, Steal Away and Deep River.
Oh, very different pieces. Of course, Steal Away, like we mentioned, actually Steal Away. Is, um, is calm, but we know that there is sort of this uh, uh, hastened message that's a part of that piece. And then, of course, Deep River has uh, is a very expansive arrangement of that with a lot of range and color and dynamic to it. So very, very different pieces. Um, some things, some basic things that you mostly know because we, we're not unaccustomed to singing spirituals. But there are um, traditions in terms of singing spirituals that we should be aware of. Um, some of the pronunciations, like for instance, uh, I think it's Deep River that has chillin', right? Instead of children, we're not going to sing children, right? We're going to actually have a little bit something... Um, um, that has a little bit more schwa's in it, a little bit more casual, so you say chillin'. But actually that happens for certain words that are not spelled out like that. And so, uh, for instance, in um, steal away, instead of, uh, you, don't, you don't sing steal away, you don't re-articulate the consonants as much as we do, but even things as to Jesus, we don't say we steal away to Jesus, you're actually saying to, to a little bit like a, like a T-A, or even uh, um, uh, to Jesus. Um, and so some of these things are, like I said, written in and articulated, and some of them are not. Also, the rhythm that we um, <laughs> that I harp on with BCCO quite a bit, and I'm leaning into the camera here to all of you in terms of triplets versus uh, 16th notes and those uh, pesky dotted rhythms. In spirituals like this, you actually have a little bit of a swing to them, and they're not quite accurate. And um, actually, that's a fantastic uh, lecture that should be done at some point um, to talk about how to swing notes. Because, you know, you think that swung notes are just triplets, but in reality, swung notes in jazz are actually all sorts. And so, you know, you have um, different people that play jazz, different of the great players, whether trumpet players, trump, uh, uh, vocalists or, or pianists or whatnot, they swing their eighth notes in completely different ways. They're not all triplets. Sometimes they're actually much, much shorter and much tighter rhythms. And so that's actually a fun uh, listening exercise to go through. But for our purposes, again, it's not that we have to sing with exacting rhythm, but that it is a little bit more casual, and it's something as an ensemble that we sort of fall into together that tends to be more triplet-like. Okay. Now, as you know, uh, especially for Deep River, there are many, many voice parts. And so I want you to just focus on the choral parts, sopranos and divisi, don't worry about what's called the soloist leaders or whatever you want to put up there. Uh, those are going to be um, um, vocally added in later. The same thing for Steal Away. Uh, for Steal Away, we're going to mainly sing the voices that you have there. Now, the, tr the tenor solo that's on page two, um, we can divide that. And so if you want to sing that line, which is uh, um, at the top, my lord, my lord, he calls me, you know, that, that section there. You can feel free to sing that as well. But, you know, if you look at uh, some of the musical characteristics of these pieces, it's pretty straightforward. You know, steal, steal away, steal a crescendo all the way to Jesus. Like, so the crescendo goes all the way to the mezzo forte on the fourth bar to Jesus. And then altos and basses, you have that syncopation there. Tom, ta, ta, di, da, dum. And Tippet actually includes a tenuto bar note there to make sure that you really show everybody in the audience that that note comes out a little bit more, that that syncopation is really present. And then this time you have mezzo forte, you continue your crescendo to forte on steal away home. I ain't, and we're not going to sing hunt or whatever it is, where it's ain't. I ain't got long to stay here. And again, not to stay here, but to stay here. Ta, like almost like a T U H. Now on page two, where it's forte, this is with renewed vigor. And so, in if we if this was a piece by Mozart, I might say marcato, but in here I would say a little bit more espressivo and accented. You know, so my Lord calls me, you know, calls me sand thunder. And then trumpets, of course, you're going to be trumpet like. We're going to be brilliant and brassy. 
um, and that dies away immediately. To Heinka long to stay here, steal away. It's pretty straightforward. Now for uh, Deep River, and of course I'm going quickly just because we're going into sectionals to work on this, so don't worry too much if you can't get all of this. Um, but Deep River, the key is to make sure that, just like a river, that everything is much more horizontal. I had to think first, which was vertically. Horizontal. And then you have sustain, so when you have the altos with that long, beautiful line that's unbroken and legato. And then those accents that are there, those are really with the, the diaphragm. Those are, those, those are supported accents. Ha! Huh. You know, low horde, low horde. You kick with the diaphragm to go through some of these notes. And then again, these rhythms, these dotted 16th note rhythms, they don't have to be so strict. They are something that's driven by how you feel. Um, but we're going to go through this in sectionals. And then I'd like to, of course... Uh, we're going to welcome back Julia, uh, who is uh, going to be leading, I think, the tenors. Um, but I want to say for those who are joining us for this summer section uh, sessions, um, who, who he wasn't here last week, but our accompanist Paul is back, and so I think he was actually present last week, but we didn't have him down to do sectionals because he was slated to be away. He stole away for some other activity, but he came back to us. And so he is back. He's going to be leading some sectionals too. And so I'd like to welcome him back to our team as well. And we're going to break off into sectionals now. And I'll see you all together in a little bit. I think I'm working with sopranos and altos. I don't remember, but I'm going to find out once Christian sorts us. And I like, oh, surprise and those. Here we are. <laughs> I think you're sorted. And the question is, how long would you like this first sectional session to run? Ah, I think we should just go to, uh, um, what did we say? So we, we said. Um, Do you want a break partway through or one, in one shot? We're, no, we're going to have a break partway through. We're going to have a little, quote, happy hour in between. So why don't we go for 20 minutes? Okay. First section. All right, here we go. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so we wanted to have a little bit of a quote, a little happy hour, a little break in between, uh, just to provide a mental break, but also um, um, just to talk about what life is like currently. And so if this is a time if you want to get a drink. Um, I should get a drink too because <laughs> the water ball's all the way back, back there. But um, I wanted to talk about um, the, what we're thinking about in terms of the, the fall. Um, as you know, organizations uh, across the nation have started canceling all the way through the calendar year, at least. And there has been a lot of discussion about what it means for choruses, because choruses, we breathe in and out um, uh, constantly, uh, and rehearsals are quite hard. And so I think uh, um, our goal is to, as always, try to maintain sort of our, our connection with people and to dive into the music. And, you know, pieces like this, like, I, like we mentioned last week, I think one of the benefits of uh, sessions like this, Zoom sessions, is that we can connect to people all around the world. Um, like I said, maybe not into England because these rehearsals are at like one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning for them. But um, perhaps maybe like Brandy Sutton, who made their debut, um, made their debut when there is a, um, um, at the Met you know, and is going to Vienna to sing and to work with us on vocal technique, I think is utterly amazing. And, uh, you know, we have plenty of people in the Bay Area too that have a lot of opportunity for us to, uh, with whom to work. And I think that they really provide a wonderful um, viewpoint that we oftentimes uh, need to check into. I think the thing about vocal singing that's interesting is that um, when we have an instrumentalist you can see the little technical things that they're doing wrong, their pinky is tight or whatnot. But for the vocal apparatus, everything is internal. And as a result, we use metaphor to talk about how to um, 
if you if you talk about how we sing, you know, we talk about a sack of potatoes and your support around the inner tube or expanding out instead of actually being able to say to an instrumentalist, for instance, just like, again, like your third finger is a little tight. I can see it tensing up here. Here's what you do to relax it. And so when you hear things from different viewpoints, even if, the, if it's the same concept, it's really sort of a powerful thing to happen because it's, it's um, I think it resonates with us and it connects to us quite a bit. Um, and so, yeah, I hear, I see some notes that people are having difficulty with connection. That's a, a problem with Zoom. You have to make sure that your computer is really uh, um, not having other things open and everything. So I mean, my connection, I think is pretty strong. So I'll try to make it pretty uh, achievable for everybody. But I think that's actually one of the difficulties um, uh, with Zoom is that it's dependent on your particular computer, it's dependent on my particular computer, it's dependent on how many people are on the internet at the same time. And when you have the lag that happens, you can tell that, you know, we can't have chamber music, we can't have rehearsals or whatnot. But um, we're really glad to have you here. Um, I also want to say that this is a time that many, many arts organizations are providing free content all over the place. When you have Yo-Yo Ma giving free concerts, this is an opportunity to connect to people like that. You know, like, uh, like my series, like I have a series that's uh, talking about Shostakovich Symphony, I Eighth String Quartet. I just can't, I, I miss talking in rehearsal to all of you. I miss talking in rehearsal to orchestra musicians. And that's my opportunity to try to do that. So if you're interested in that, check out the website. Like uh, there's a dancer friend of mine who's doing uh, the series that I'm participating with. Christopher Wielden, who won a Tony, did American Paris on Broadway. And he's just like, he's just baking because he has nothing else to do. And so on Thursday, like 5.30, if you want to just chat with Christopher Wielden, which I don't even, I've never even chatted with him before. And I'm in the same business with him. We've worked on the same repertoire together. Um, this is your opportunity to uh, uh, do things like that. You know, San Francisco Symphony, Chicago Symphony is putting out uh, uh, concerts, Detroit Symphony. You know, so this is a time I would really urge you to check out what is available online. For a while, Berlin Philharmonic made their entire concert series, every single concert they've ever done, called the Digital Concert hall in high fidelity with great video great sound for free for free and so this is one of those times so um, there are some big difficulties that come with uh, not being able to see each other to rehearse together but there's also a lot of silver lining and like I mentioned um, we want to look back to some of these moments and again my favorite part about Brandy Sutton is that yeah sometimes her singing was too loud for the microphone her personality was too big for the medium. But the, the, the performance that came through, it was like she was right in front of us. I mean, like you got drawn into her room, you know? And it just, it was, it's not something I'm gonna forget. And, and I think I, meant, I might've mentioned this, but uh, um, when I was in a gospel choir in college, I was one of the only non-African-Americans. I was one of two Asians I was in the choir. And there was this sing-off between this visiting gospel choir and our choir. And Laquita Mitchell, who sang, who sings with the Met Opera, she sings with the San Francisco Opera, sings with all these major, major companies as Bess. In fact, I think it's actually sung with Brandy Sutton because she was Bess and Brandy was Clara. The one, Clara is the one that sings Summertime. And it was unbelievable, the voices between that were singing back and forth. And just completely different voices, but such engagement, such passion, such uh, uh, connection to what they were singing. And that's a moment that I won't forget. But when Brandy uh, started singing again, that was likewise, I got drawn into that same moment. It was the same feeling of this complete, um, um, it's like she pulled you into that performance. And so that's what we want to try to emulate. So, okay, so we just wanted to have a little break um, and uh, allow ourselves bathroom or water or whatnot. But I think we're gonna go back into sectionals and same voice parts and continue our vocalizing. But again, always trying to remember that even though we work on these technical aspects that we're trying to connect to uh, um, the underlying meaning of the music. And so that affects how we approach these technically. And so we need to build that into our practice because remember practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. And so even though, and uh, actually one of the Met Orchestra musicians was doing a masterclass and he said this, it's brilliant. He said, 
oftentimes, no, it's not often that we can arbitrarily rise to the occasion, but most times we default to what we have practiced. And so if we practice all these parts and practice at a high level, that's what comes out. And so while we practice and when we learn this music, even if we're struggling to find the notes, we need to always remember that it has a deep connection to the meaning and to the way we approach the singing, the tone. And we keep that as part of our practice, then it becomes a natural part that we can't help but to sing like that when we perform. So we're gonna go back into sectionals continue with our rehearsing, and I will see you back in a little bit. I think we're all back. Hello, everybody. So I think we actually have more participants than we started with. I don't know how that happened. But in any case, welcome, everybody. Um, so, you know, in going through this, I think that one of my favorite parts about this arrangement of Deep River that we need to see is that when you have sort of this repetition that it never has a monotonous quality to it, that there's a change of dynamic, there's a change of intention, and that we never change the tone when we change the volume. And this is something that we talk about actually with romantic music, romantic era music all the time, right? Is that dynamic and tone color are very different things. And so with Brahms, a piano, is more to do with the tone that you perform at rather than the volume. And here, it's actually the almost exact opposite. You actually have changes of volume that can be quite significant, but that tone, that espressivo, that intention, that engagement never changes. And so whether you're singing quietly with intensity or you're singing full out with either joy or crying out, that there is sort of a depth to that emotion, uh, those emotions that are there that never leaves and that affects the way we sing. It's a more full-throated singing. It's, a less, uh, um, it's, it's less about variations in tone color. It's more about variations in emotive strength, right? Uh, sorry, emotive character, not strength, because it's always strong. So when we sing through Deep River, when you listen to the various performances, what you're trying to distinguish is how well they do what Brandy did. How well do they bring across the message? And when they have a pianissimo, do they bring a certain color to it? Do they have a certain intention behind the volume change? Do they have a certain intention when they sing about the trumpets or when they sing about the children? You know, when you sing the word chillin', you need to feel like there's not only, like we talked about depth of character in a play, you know, it's not just the way you approach it, but it's all the background of everything that happened before. It's the character in that moment saying it. And you want to be able to portray to the audience that change, that variety, that sort of depth of, of shading that is not just two dimensional. And the same thing happens to this when you have different performances. When you hear a chorus perform, it shouldn't just be about, oh, they were in tune or, oh, there's so much vibrato I couldn't really tell. It's like there's a message come through. So when when you sing this, like we're about to right now, we we'll sing through Deep River. I want you to really feel like you're connecting to the sound that you hear from the chorus. And then over the week, before we come back next week, we should listen to various, you listen to various things online. There's beauty about online now and YouTube. There's so many different recordings that are out there and see, oh, I really like that one. For some reason, it just, it, it, it connected to the way, you know, like I feel it. You know, and actually that happened, um, I think Christian and I were talking about one of the performances, he's just like of the Brahms that we did last time. In Brahms, he said, you know, like there's this one performance, it just felt so easy to sing because everything felt so natural. And so just feel what different performances, how you connect to them, how you sing with them, how the changes of color affect you. So as we sing through this version, maybe this is a version that's great for you, maybe it isn't. But regardless, see if you can connect to what the singers are singing. See if you can connect to what you feel in the music is there. So let's do Deep River and we'll talk a little bit after that.
Now that ending is so fantastic to me because it never feels settled. Come down the Lord. It's like the journey is still continuing, right? And if you look at the words specifically, deep river, as you all know, deep river, my home is over Jordan, deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. And so you're not home, you're longing for home. And there's this big, deep river, you know, symbolic. There's this journey ahead of you. There's this barrier between you and home. And from the very first chord, we need to feel that longing and depth. And so when we talk about pianissimo, that is the most intense pianissimo, you know? And so there's a way that we sing when we sing with depth, and that means using a little bit of richness to it. And when you have that sort of engaged singing, you know, oftentimes with, especially with basses or whatnot, we talk about expanding here. It's like we want to sing with like depth of width, right? Deep river, instead of deep river, we don't want it to be pristine because there's a, such depth to that first chord, you know? And then this chord. Now on the piano, it sounds mundane. But you know with voices, especially with the basses in BCCO, when you sing that F sharp down there, I would say to the basses, it doesn't make a difference what dynamic you have. You need to swallow the rest of the chorus there, that we're enveloped in the sound of the basses, right? And then home is over. Jordan, right? That leap is just the beginning of that crescendo that goes away to Jordan. And so sopranos, when we have that E, but everybody, the tenors, that E that sustains and builds and blossoms, it needs to have this welling of up, welling of, of dynamic and just overflowing into the next bar. And then the same thing I was telling with the sopranos and altos, we don't take a breath until the very last end of that line. Um, over Jordan, deep. And this is <laughs> where we actually do the opposite of what we normally say, especially because it's a cappella. It doesn't make a difference how long that breath is. We can stretch it so we have enough time. But again, to have the nice seated breath that allows us to sing the next words again, deep river, with a depth, with that intention, that yearning, that longing, that's what's important. I was talking a little bit with the Sopranos and Altos, and I want to just actually go overview this a little bit to talk about the dynamics, to see the shape, because we know that it's an ABA. We have some music at the beginning, there's a middle section that's much more energetic, and then we come back to the same music at the end. But it actually changes quite a bit over time. And so, if you see at the very beginning, pianissimo, but this intense pianissimo that we talked about, the, the soloists come in, and even though they say piano, for me, I would want the chorus to still have the predominant texture because we want to hear, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. That's the most important thing. They sing their interjections. The soprano ones are pianissimo above it, but we want to hear the tenor twos, baritones, soprano twos, and altos, the rich, dark voices, right, that are there in the bottom of that lard. Lord, I want to cross over into campground. That's the predominant texture. And then as we go on, you see there's a lot of <clears throat> call and response between the sections. And so this crescendos from this pianissimo piano to mezzo forte to forte. And then we get to that middle section, that B section. I'm sorry, it diminuendos back into piano, piano. But then we have this middle section, this B section, which is fortissimo. And then you can see on page 20 that we have this sort of, it's almost like this tidal wave of music that happens. We started, it's really dark here. Hey Google, turn on the living room lights. Sorry. Hey Google, turn on the dining room lights. Is that better? Okay, that's, that's a little better. So, okay. I never remember which is the dining room, which is the living room, but it's just a mental block of mine. But um, if you see on page 20, the third bar, the tenors and basses start, sopranos and altos start to continue after that. And then the vocal leaders continue after that. So if you only play the 16th notes, you have this tidal wave, right? 
And then you have ta da 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 da, chillin', 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 right? You have these voices coming all over the place. And then if you have this in performance, you really have this antiphonal sound, these voices coming from all over the place where you re- literally actually feel the wave of sonic, you know, the sonic wave that goes across the chorus and also has the interjections of these accents of chillin' and chillin', chillin'. And so this is that's the most important part, is to hear those different voice lines. Now this fortissimo happens to go through. Oh, chillin', don't you want to go to the gospel feast, that promised land, right? And uh, like I said to the Sopranos and Althos, there's no diminuendo in that statement. You don't want to say, don't you want to go to that promised land? That has no conviction whatsoever. Don't you want to go to that promised land, that feast? And so there is no, even though you have 16 notes, you have these chord notes that are still strong, this fortissimo. The intent is this want to portray this message. Don't you want to go to the promised land? And then the one time where it pulls back in dynamic on page 21, gospel feast, that promised land, that land where all is peace. Now, that to me is the most special moment of this entire gospel spiritual. That is where the tone would change from this unsettled yearning to feel like you can portray that feeling of peace. And that moment, not the loudest moment, but one of the quietest moments is to me the centerpiece of this, the, the, the vocal point of this movement. And so that has to be the most beautiful sung feeling of peace and the sentiment of peace. And of course, he immediately shows you the next bar on the bottom of page 21 that we're still not there because walk into heaven with fortissimo, with angular rhythms, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta. Ta 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 ta. And then you see again, it goes from the tenors and basses to the altos and sopranos to the vocal soloists there. And the vocal soloists, you know, the tenor goes to a G sharp, the soprano goes to a B. You know, it's quite a stupendous, incredible moment, right? But again, the more contrast that you have from the section of peace and to show in this next section at the bottom of the page, you know, with force that we're not there yet and you demand it, you're wanting it, you know, um, I think it's really important. Again, the bottom of page 21, that there is no diminuendo, that message is not there. And then on page 22, unlike the section that just happened beforehand, where we had this feeling that we would end up at peace when we come home, when we have 22, it diminuendos to forte. And the only reason why it's forte is because there's all these textures there. And so you want to show, Lord, I want to cross over into campground, even more insistent. We would change, you know. And then when we get to page 23 and we actually do have this diminuendo, there is no change of sentiment there. In fact, the very end should not be a feeling of rest, should feel it have even more intensity in the pianissimo there, right? And so when we have those last few pages, that go from piano, these swelling to mezzo piano. Some people might say, oh, we're gonna die off. Like you're leaving, like a parade is leaving town and it goes off in the distance. And this almost exact opposite, that there's a building of intensity that goes to the very end. And so when you get to those last chords where you say, Lord, I want to cross over into camp, campground, Lord, that last Lord, uh, that uh, the sopranos and tenors sing needs to have such almost pathos in it, such intensity that even though it's pianissimo, that there's no mistaking the genesis and the, of the feelings of this piece. You know, the danger, like Steal Away too, is that there's such beauty in the chords and the phrase structure, the melodies that we lose sight of the intensity and the depth of feeling that's behind those, that, those notes. So Christian, if it's okay, why don't we play Deep River, I'm sorry, Deep River again that we can sing through. But again, this time feeling like there's a deeper connection to the words 
And the more you repeat it, the more insistent you are and that we're not settled until we try to find peace, which we don't have in this movement. So let's try singing through again. So we often talk about with musicians, but uh, since I'm a conductor, I usually talk to conductors about this um, concept quite a bit, that listening to a recording at the very beginning oftentimes sort of defaults you to a certain approach of the music. And it makes it hard when you listen to others or to develop your own idea of what the piece might be because you immediately have a template of what you heard, immediately heard. But this is where it becomes, you know, uh, as a performer, you can start to feel like, what are those performances that you really feel connect to how you feel about the music? What are those performances that really feel like bring to you, bring out what you think the music is saying? And so as we go through this, 
and we talked with Brandy about the messages and Julia talked about the messages that spirituals had that oftentimes um, slaves and um, um, African Americans didn't have ways to communicate with each other, but they did it through song. These songs were of protest. These songs were of crying. These songs were of longing. You know, it's like I said, it's too often that we consider some of these gospels just be gorgeous singing and we just want it to be in tune and be, be beautiful. And, um, and it's really important, I think, to remember that the, uh, the, the meaning and the genesis of these works gives these pieces its emotional depth. And for me, I like to hear different choruses after I've had a chance to look at the music and try to see what I see in it first. Because sometimes, you know, they're, they're like master classes. You know, you hear a symphony from a great conductor and just like, oh my goodness, that's a viewpoint that's amazing. That's incredible. And then some of them you're like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't really connect to it, but that's a really interesting viewpoint. And so I would urge you, like I said, I would sing along to different recordings along the way and just see how you feel about them. Some of them like for Steal Away are so much faster. Some of them are really slow. What does it do when you change the tempo like that? What does it do when everybody's singing with this full throated vibrato? Does it become too unwieldy and too messy when you have such tight writing? Or does it become even more evocative? Or does a clean approach to it clean up some of the lines and show this antiphonal singing, but does it lose character because of it? These are all the questions that you can have when you're listening to it and makes even listening to it and rehearsing, practicing by yourself, you know, listening, singing along with these recordings, even so, I mean, like a, a fantastic exercise because you feel in it completely different things depending on how people are performing. And I think when we do have an opportunity to perform all together, it's going to make us even uh, more hyper aware of the people with whom we sing, who they are as people and who they are as performers, right? Not only who they are, but as we try to do as singers and performers, we want to bring a part of who we are into the performance. And that's what makes singing so special is because it is not just a faceless chorus of very random voices. Every single person is important. Every single voice is important. And with BCCO, this happened many times. If all of us just kind of fade off into the background and say, you know what, I'm a little bit unsure of my note here, so I'm going to let others hold the, uh, the, the um, burden a little bit. Suddenly, it like travels through the chorus and the whole performance is much less... Uh, connected, it's much less direct and uh, musical. And if we all take that voice, or take that viewpoint to say all of our voices are important, my voice in a chorus of 200, if a chorus in 117 now is important, um, it becomes this very special moment where we become, you know, unified as a community, as a chorus. So what I want to do is sing through Steal Away a couple of times now. Once and then we'll talk about some musical things. And then we will do um, uh, talk about some musical ideas and then sing through it again to close off today's evening. So Christian, if you can sing, uh, uh, if you can sing, if you can play Steal Away, uh, we'll sing through it once and then talk about some things and then sing through it again.
Ah, oh, beautiful. Um, you know, one thing that's hard about that transcription that we were following online, unless you were following with your music, is that there's no dynamics that are written in there. And so for this, there is a couple dynamic things that actually deviated from what you actually see in the score. You know, of course, this is the same sort of structure that we saw in Deep River, but it is just much shorter. It's an ABA, we sing Steal Away. In the middle of the section, the verse section with those solos, my Lord calls me by the thunder, right? And then we come back to Steal Away again at the end. So an ABA um, structure, which is very traditional. But if you look at that B section, my Lord calls me by the thunder, right? Of course, it should be sung thunderously. It should be sung with such meaning and purpose, right? But the thing that I thought was really interesting is when they sang the trumpet sounds within my soul, within my soul, for some reason they had a diminuendo over the line. The trumpet sounds within my soul. It doesn't sound like the trumpet continued or had power, right? And if you look at that diminuendo, it's only on the last note. The trumpet needs to remain strong. Our voices need to remain strong. The sopranos and altos with this uh, ah ha ha ha, you know, ah ha ha ha, is the fortissimo, as if they were trumpets. You know, and uh, um, when I was in um, undergrad, we used to perform at Princeton um, Cathedral. It wasn't Princeton University, but our, 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 my undergrad was in the town of Princeton, uh, Westminster Choir College. And so we used to perform at Princeton Cathedral. And the freshman chorus would always be in the back of the, of the um, chapel. And it's chiastic, of course, it's shaped like a cross. And we'd be at the very entrance and all the way up to the altar, you know, be farthest away from the altar. But the organ would be all the way near the altar or up really high except for this row of brass trumpets right behind our heads. And the freshmen, not knowing this, would get their ears blasted out, like, kind of like suddenly surprised. And after your freshman year, that was one of the favorite moments for all the sophomores, juniors, seniors, and graduate students, is to wait for that moment to see the freshmen just jump out of their skins for those trumpets that were just filling the entire hall, but right behind the heads of the, of the freshmen. And that's sort of the same sort of character of this. You know, my Lord calls me by the thunder, the trumpet within my soul. And so, you know, that's where a section where I would say, are there choruses that don't diminuendo there? Are they so intent on drawing a beautiful line that they lose the intention of that text? The trumpet sounds within my soul then you can diminuendo because it echoes in, imagine the cathedral. I ain't got long to stay here. Then you go back to steal away, steal away. And you know, to me, you can say steal away, steal away. There's something about those first consonants, steal away, that show off intention. If you just make it not bland, but if you don't have intention behind it and you just do perfect choral singing, steal away. Steve. It sort of is, is a little bit, you know, um, it's sort of uh, um, faceless, you know, it doesn't have like, it's just, it's beautiful choral sing. But if you have this intention of the consonants, use them a little bit more, accent them along, elongate them. Steal away, steal away. That's what you're looking for. It has such a, um, it's more communicative, right? You're saying something to somebody. And I think that's what we want in this music is to be able to say something to somebody. So for our last things, why don't we sing through Steal Away again for the last time, but bringing those things in, in, um, into mind that there is intention behind the word Steal Away, that when we get to that middle section, especially with the tenors and basses or the sopranos and altos with the trumpet sound, unlike the recording we're singing along to, don't let that sentiment, don't let that dynamic die away. Let the trumpet within your soul continue to sing until the music in your hand says the diminuendo, right? And of course, that the ending, Steal Away, just like Deep River, is not something that is, is lacking or sort of softer because it's come to peace,
but it still has that same message from the beginning, okay? So to end today's session, why don't we sing Steal It Away one last time. Beautiful. Um, so next week, again, Brandy Sen will be joining us again and will be leading us through some vocal leases and again, talking, I'm sure, about her experiences or whatnot. So um, we'll see you next week. And again, I would go through, I mean, this is just such a wonderful expo exploration of various recordings and sing along with them and see, you know, I mean, especially for Steal Away, like we mentioned, the Tempe are all over the place. Some people sing it really fast. Some people sing it really slow. You know, does it change the emotional content? Does it feel like, how does it feel different when those aspects of the musicality are changed, right? Are there ones that sing it more straight tone? Are there ones that sing it more with vibrato? You know, how does that change how you feel about the music and how you feel about what they're bringing out in the music? Um, it's a really interesting experiment to participate in. And it's part of the fun, I think. And so next week will be our last week and we will have more information if we can get a hold of these videographers to make sure that we can uh, um, uh, try to have a memento of this, uh, this time together. But um, I miss you guys all so much because like, like we've, I've been having the same conversation in four different sessions, how musicians, performers, dancers, everybody misses that nonverbal communication that happens when people are in person together. That the person that you're seeing next to, you can feel how they're moving, hear them singing, etc. And so I think we're all missing this very much, but to connect over music like this, I think is still um, really meaningful. So with that, we will say good night. We will see you next week we're with Brandy again, and of course, Julia and Paul. So um, let's do our BCCO. Unmute everybody and say goodbye at the same time. <laughs> and 